um, where in the genome are the regions responsible for terpenoid production, which are um, the smell, they produce the smell, um, and that is crucial for the medical and the recreational industry. And we also want to understand where in the genome are the regions responsible for fiber production in hemp, which is crucial for the um, hemp industry. We also uh, want to understand how many species of cannabis are. We don't know yet how many um, species there are in this genus. Some say one, others say two, three, or four. And by understanding the genome, we would, um, we would establish how many species there are and their relationship. And not only the relationship between these groupings, but also between the modern strains. So for example, is OG Kush more closely related to sour diesel? So, so we don't know. And we can also develop DNA fingerprinting, which is kind of like a barcode that distinguishes one strain from the other. It gives us the uniqueness of each of the strains. So our research is also very important because our questions are questions that have been asked by scientists for centuries. So Mendel, for example, wanted to understand how our traits inherited from parents to offspring. Darwin wanted to understand how are individuals related to each other. Our questions have been asked in many other crops and answered in many other crops and have improved the breeding of these other crops substantially in corn, in rice, in soy, in wheat. So our research would have huge impacts because we would improve the existing strains in quality and consistency because the time to develop new strains by conventional methods will shorten, and because breeders and growers can identify plant traits when the plants are, are seedlings or even before they germinate, and that, and that would save time and resources and money. So how are we making this happen? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my work in the cane lab. Um, this is one of the questions that I've been working on. I would like to understand the genetic variation in the maternally inherited genomes. So during sexual reproduction, the male provides half of the genetic material. Okay, so we have the cell, and in the cell we have the nucleus. And uh, in the nucleus we have the DNA. The male provides half of the DNA from the nucleus. The female provides the other half. So the nuclear genome, it's diploid. So it comes half from mom and half from dad, right? Um, but the female, in addition to providing half of the nuclear genome, provides the rest of the cell. And in the rest of the cell, we have other organelles, so small organs are organelles, like the mitochondria and the chloroplast. The mitochondria and the chloroplast are crucial in the cell because the mitochondria um, provides energy for the cell. The chloroplast is the one that's responsible for photosynthesis in plants, so basically producing um, food from light, which is responsible for life on Earth and from, for us being here and for me talking to you. So um, the chloroplast and the mitochondria have a genome of their own, and it's a smaller genome, much smaller than the genome from the nucleus. So, um, and these genomes are haploid because they only come from the mom, right? Diploid is the nucleus that comes from mom and dad. Haploid is the mitochondria and the chloroplast because it only comes from the mom. So why am I interested in determining the genetic variation in the maternally inherited genomes? Well, because this would allow us to understand how are traits inherited from parents to offspring and this would allow us to understand how our individuals related to one another. And this would also allow us to understand where in the genome are the regions responsible for all of these products. So how am I doing this? So before I answer this question, I need you to know two things about cannabis. The first thing is that cannabis has female plants, it has male plants, these male plants produce pollen, and it also has hermaphrodites that produce, both, that produce both male and female flowers. We know that the females have an X, have two X chromosomes, like us human females, that the males have an X and a Y chromosome, also like us. We don't know much about the hermaphrodites. 
The second thing that I need you to know about cannabis is that the cannabis genome has been sequenced. The cannabis genome was sequenced in 2011 by a Canadian group. Um, they sequenced three different strains, a purple kush, Finola and USO31. Finola and USO31 are hemp. Um, these genomes are publicly available. Anyone that has internet can access these genomes and, and download them to their computer. So um, the genome is 830 million base pairs, so 830 million letters, and 64% of it has been assembled. So 64% of the puzzle has been put together. In addition to these three publicly available genomes, we have um, the Kane Lab, we sequenced 40 other genomes. In these 40 genomes, we have sativas, we have indicas, we have hybrids, which are usually the crosses between sativa and indica, and we, had, we have hemp's. So um, you can, I don't know if you can see this very well, but um, some of them are highlighted in pink, um, and those are females. Um, those are 32 individuals. Some of them are highlighted in blue, and those are male, and those are nine individuals. The ones that are in uh, orange are, were females, but in those populations, we know that there are hermaphrodites. And then the three that are in purple are the ones that were previously sequenced. So in total, we have 40, 50, uh, 43 individuals. So what I did is that I took the, um, the genomes from the chloroplast and the mitochondria, and I assembled them. For the chloroplast, I used the genome of mulberry as a reference, so kind of like as a guide, because, because uh, at that point, it was the closest related species to cannabis that had been sequenced. So um, they diverged 50 million years ago, so they shared a common ancestor 50 million years ago, and that's a long time. It's when the Himalayas were forming just for you to know another fact. And then, uh, and the cannabis genome is much smaller than, it, sorry, the mulberry genome is much smaller than cannabis, it's less than half. Um, and this is the assembled chloroplast from uh, a Carmagnola hemp. This is the first chloroplast that has been assembled for cannabis. It's publicly available in NCBI. If you go to, to uh, GenBank and type this number, you can get the, the chloroplast. The chloroplast is a circular genome, and that's why this is a circle. Each of those boxes is a gene. Um, and the total uh, size of the chloroplast is 153,871 letters. But what I wanted to understand was what are the differences between all of these 43 genomes? How are these genomes related and how are they different from each other? So in order to do that, I did a haplotype network. So haplotype again because it comes from mom only, right? So it's a haploid genome, so it's haplotype. A network, it shows us how are individuals related to each other. So I'm gonna walk you through this graph. So each of these circles is a different haplotype. Our Carmagnola hemp that I showed you, so this guy over here, it's part of these 32 individuals over there that share that haplotype. So each of these circles represent a different haplotype and the, the area or the diameter of the circle represent the number of individuals that share that haplotype, that bear that haplotype. Okay, is that clear? Good. So uh, we have 32 individuals that share that home common haplotype. And then for example, that individual over there, canatonic, is two steps away from this common haplotype, one, two. This individual R4 is one step away. And we can see that this common haplotype, we have sativas, which are the red ones, we have indicas, which are the yellow ones, we have hybrids, which are the pink ones, and we have hemp. Now we can also see from this haplotype that hemp individuals bear six of the eight haplotypes. And we can also see that the sativas, indicas, and hybrids only have three. 
right? So we have that Libanese of individual over here. We have the ones that are in the common haplotype and we have canatonic and R4. So I did the same thing for the mitochondria. And the mitochondria tells us a very similar story. Again, we have a common haplotype that is shared between 34 individuals. We can see that hemp is present in the five of the five haplotypes. Um, and we can see that um, the Lebanese and Dagestani, which are two hybrids, share a different haplotype than the common haplotype. So what I just showed you is the maternally inherited part of the genome and how individuals are related through these maternally inherited genomes. So in general, to conclude, hems harbor a different haplotype in both the chloroplast, six out of eight, and the mitochondria, three out of five. Uh, in general, they're more diverse. Um, we have a common mitochondrial haplotype that is shared by 79% of the individuals. We have a common chloroplast haplotype that is shared between 74% of the individuals. The hybrids Lebanese, Canatonic, Diindica, R4, share a different chloro um, chloroplast haplotype. And Lebanese is the only medical and recreational strain that harbors a different mitochondria and chloroplast haplotypes. So uh, in general, we see that there is a very low mutation rate in the maternally inherited genomes. So I didn't show you this data, but in the nuclear genome, we see a completely different story. The nuclear genome is very varied. Um, so it does not provide resolution um, to, um, for the genetic analysis of, in general, of the, the cannabis population. And this is because uh, it is inherited only from the mom, and it's also because pollen might travel far. This is a wind-pollinated plant, so pollen can go really far, but seeds cannot. So the genomes that come from the dad, the part of the nuclear genome that comes from the dad, can potentially travel very far away. So in the future, I would like to determine um, how is sex determination related to the mitochondria and to the chloroplast genomes. Because it's been found that there is some relationship between sex determination and these maternally inherited genomes. And that there are nuclear and, and uh, mitochondrial interactions. And I would like to understand how do the chromosomes, the sexual chromosomes evolve and how are they related to the mitochondrial genome and to the chloroplast genome. So with that, I would like to acknowledge my lab mates, uh, my advisor, Nolan Kane, and I would like to encourage you to donate to our research. Uh, please visit our website, agriculturalgenomics.org, um, and then and you can find ways to donate and also we also accept donations of, of plant material if you have plants that you want to donate. Um, and thank you very much. So how do we donate plant material? Uh, you email me and, and we can figure that out. Yes. It tastes like an indica, yes. Well, yeah. Well, that's a really good question. Um, so I am gonna tell you a little bit about something that I didn't talk about, but the nuclear part of the genome 
does tell us that there are differences between what people call indicas and sativas. So it appears as there that those groupings, we don't know if they're species or subspecies, but those groupings are real. Um, now, when you have a hybrid, you have, okay, a plant that looks like an indica and tastes like a sativa, but smells like, a, you know, and you have all of these traits. So what that means is that you can shuffle these genes around. Um, so, so that is, so, so I, I, that answers part of your question. Now, how to go with people? Well, I guess that at some point in the future, what we want to develop are tests that would tell you, hey, this plant over here has this region of the genome that comes from there, this region of the genome that comes from over there, and then, okay, yeah, definitely the leaf part of the genomes, the leaves look like a sativa, but uh, this part of the THC synthase or whatever other part of the genome looks more like an indica, and that's something that we're gonna, those are, th that's something that we're developing right now. And in the future, hopefully we'll have small tests that we can do and can tell you, you know, like, okay, this part of the region, the, of the genome, at least we know that comes from indica or from sativa. Yes. So that is a, that is a, a field in, in biology that it's called biogeography. Yes, we want to do biogeographical studies, but definitely the mitochondria and the, and the chloroplasts would not be the genomes to use because so far what they show is that there is very little variation, that they, it doesn't show, it doesn't portray the overall genetic variation. So we cannot use the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Like this, this story is a pretty cool story because we don't know why they are so, there's so little variation. And it's showing a particular pattern which is a, a selective sweep. We call, in, in, in biology, in evolution, we call that a selective sweep, which is different from other patterns. It's different from, from a bottleneck or, or from genetic drift. So, and we want to know why, and we think that it's due to um, sex evolution. Because in cannabis we find males, females, and hermaphrodites. And that is not common. Usually you have plants that are dioecious, where you have males and you have females, or, or, or you have hermaphrodites, monoecious, but the three of them is, is not common to find. And we think that that's new in evolutionary time. And we think that that, that um, that we can see signatures of that through the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Which, so, so, it, so to answer your question, no, it is not a good idea to use the chloroplast and, mito and the mitochondria to understand biogeographical patterns. Yes. No, we use, we use a plant. So um, we have certain things that, that we can do on campus. We, we can analyze DNA, so we can extract, so we have volunteers that extract DNA from the plants off campus and then we bring the DNA on campus. And, and we, can, we can have plants on campus that, are less, that have less than 0.3% THC. Uh, we can grow that, so hemp we can grow on campus. Um, and then we can also study the DNA because DNA is classified as data. So we can, and, and in general, all of, most of the data that we're using, we download to a computer. I mean, if there's three genomes that are available, you can download, like anyone can download those genomes. And at the beginning, we started exploring those three genomes. So, so there's a lot of things that we can do, even though we cannot grow every single plant on campus, and we cannot do crosses on campus, because we cannot have any plant that is more than 0.3% THC. So we are looking whether NSF can accept grants, given that it's legal in Colorado. And some people from NSF have said yes, some people f have said no. Um, but, but yeah, but federal funding is, is hard in science in general. Federal funding is hard. But for this, it's been harder, and that's why we ask for donations, because our research is possible thanks 
to you. Like right now, the funds that we have have been thanks to to you. So, so yeah. So please, I donate. We have where four of us are working on on this project, and one of them is graduating, and and at some point we're gonna run out of money. So. Well, thank you very much. Okay, thanks everybody. So it's uh, just about five minutes to three. In room 204, we have Reverence, Revelry, and Remedy, the Global History of Cannabis. And then in room 207, we have On the Streets, Law Enforcement and Social Justice. And here in the courtroom, we have a career exploration panel for individuals who are interested in exploring the industry. Thanks, enjoy the next panel.